Thank you very much for inviting me. You know, in the US, they say that, you know, if you do not do a good job, you say, well, you know, I did it at 2 a.m. in the morning, you know. And it's literally 2 a.m. in the morning for me, you know, so, because <laughs> I just came in at 1 a.m. this morning, okay. So, uh, I will talk about uh, the future of hardware technologies for computing. Um, is there an echo or something? Okay, you guys can hear me, right? Okay, good. Uh, especially our next 3D mosaic project. And, you know, we have this, you know, uh, this idea that we have been working on that I'm super excited about called the illusion scale up. And then I'll also talk about co-design. Uh, but before I start, I would like to thank my uh, uh, students, my uh, collaborators and the sponsors, because, you know, they did all the work. You know, I'm just having fun in Switzerland, you know, uh, you know presenting their work and I literally mean it. Uh, so let's get into the, you know, the presentation. So the early days of computing were dominated by relays, vacuum tubes, and discrete transistors. You know, we are talking about really, really early days of computing. And then came these things that we use today, the integrated circuit chips. And, you know, uh, so Jack Kilby, all of you know about Kilby, I hope, you know, uh, proposed what he called the monolithic idea and the revolution started. But it was actually not that easy for Kilby. So um, if you read Kilby's Nobel lecture, uh, he got the Nobel Prize in 2000. He actually talks about, you know, three issues that the people that didn't like integrated circuits used to complain about. The first thing they used to complain about is that the yield, which is like what percentage of chips you know, would be working correctly, the yields would always be too low to be profitable. That was the first you know, complaint people had. The second complaint uh, that people had was during that time, uh, the best devices were not made out of Semiconductors, what you know, Kilby really means by semiconductors are these you know kind of the materials that we put in you know integrated circuits, and the third one is that you know like Kilby talks about this as well, that the true transistor people that invented you know the discrete transistors and you know worked on the discrete transistors, they did not want their elegant devices to be messed up with all the other stuff you know you know like R's and C's and this and that inside a chip. And that's why, you know, you know, those people thought that this thing would never go anywhere, this integrated circuit thing, right? And, but, you know, of course, we know 60 years later that it has revolutionized, you know, the world. Now, since, you know, David talked about nanotechnologies, today's nanotechnology concerns exactly resonate those things that Kilby heard 60 years back. People talk about exactly these issues, you know, when it comes to nanotechnologies and so on. So, but, you know, so, so those integrated circuits have done a fantastic job, have revolutionized almost everything, you know, over the past 60 years, but now is the time to think about the next level of integration. And that's because, you know, you have to worry about what I call abundant data computing, you know, machine learning, AI, you know, this is a workshop about AJI, for example, that's an example of abundant data computing. Now, if you look at abundant data computing, you know, there are many walls simultaneously. You know, Professor Mutlu just talked about the memory wall. You know, I have a much simpler picture to just, you know, make the point that he was making that, you know, a tremendous amount of energy and execution time are spent trying to access off-chip memory. So, you know, I don't have to repeat. Professor Mutlu already said that. But at the same time, there is this coming miniaturization wall which nobody really talks about. You know, it's this, you know, this, this, this little you know, dirty secret that our industry has, which is that in whatever number of years, you know, so we, you know, depending on who you talk to, we are either at a five nanometer or a three nanometer and so on and so forth. But you know, like how far are you going to go? The font size is actually scaled by you know, 0.7. So you know, maybe 0.1 nanometer node and so on. So you know, it's going to stop. So this is crazy, right? On one hand, you have the memory wall, which means putting more and more memory on a chip is only going to be beneficial for you. And right at that point in time, you're going to have the miniaturization wall, which means that you're not going to be able to miniaturize things inside a chip, which had been our you know, way of putting more and more stuff inside the chip. And in addition to that, there is a power wall, 
that has been going on for a while. That's why we have you know domain specific accelerators, you know the resilience wall. You know Professor Mudlu talked about reliability and so on and so forth. So the question really is, what are we going to do? So we have to think about a new way of you know doing things. We cannot just simply go business as usual and think that you know things will magically just work out. And this is where comes the notion of nano systems. So what is a nano system? So obviously to build nano systems, you have to have new nanotechnologies, which could mean new devices, new fabrication technologies, new sensors, and so on and so forth. But using these new nanotechnologies, what is really important is that you are able to build new architectures that are not possible or extremely difficult with existing technologies. Why so? Because if you just take existing architectures and if you just replace existing technologies with new technologies, you are stuck by the bottlenecks of the existing architecture. So you're not going to get much benefits. And I will show some examples of that. And obviously, when you enable new architectures, you can also enable new applications. That's the abundant data applications that we are talking about you know, in, you know, you know, for, for this presentation. Or, for this workshop in general. So in spite of significant progress over the past 60 years, you know, uh, computing today is pretty basic. You actually have a two-dimensional plane of transistors, right? You have some wire stacks in the third dimension, and you have this memory chip that's sitting very far from the compute chip that you know, Professor Mutlu was talking about. And you spend this enormous time and energy shuttling data back and forth between the compute chip and the memory chip. So, and, and we talked about the miniaturization wall, right? So that's where we are. Uh, the question really is, what are we going to do? And this is where comes this notion of what I call computation immersed in memory. So moving forward, what we want is multiple layers of highly efficient logic multiple layers of dense memory that are densely interleaved in a fine-grained fashion between the logic layers. So you have interleaving of logic layers and memory layers, you know, densely interleaved. You could actually have a layer of sensors, for example, on the top, especially, you know, from an AGI standpoint, for example, for added functionality. But if there was one message that I wanted you to take home from this uh, presentation, that would be the ultra-dense 3D integration of all these various layers. So once you do that, what you enable, you get out of the miniaturization wall because now you can have many layers. But if you have many layers, that means you are building a skyscraper, for example. And if you build a skyscraper, it would be terrible to have many floors but without any elevators that are connecting the floors. So that's a notion of this ultra-dense 3D connectivity between the various layers. And that is the key to very large energy delay product benefits. So for uh, this presentation, I would be using energy delay product as the metric for you know, performance. And you can ask me a question you know, uh, during the Q&A why. But, uh, but if you can do this, that would be the path to 100x to 1,000x energy delay product benefit. And this is this notion of NEXT 3D, where NEXT stands for Nano Engineered Computing Systems Technology. Okay. So uh, as I said, that the first part of this presentation, or the you know, first topic that I want to cover is this notion of NEXT 3D mosaic. So NEXT 3D mosaic draws on this NEXT 3D that I was talking about on the previous slide. And essentially, it looks at a two-dimensional two space. So the y-axis is what I call on-chip 3D integration. So you can see that there are many of these 3D chips, these next 3D chips that we were showing on the previous slide. And the x-axis is this notion of inter-chip integration continuum, which means that many of these next 3D chips are connected with each other using maybe through silicon vias, using interposers, and so on and so forth. So you got a two-dimensional space, right? So for the rest of this presentation, I'll be using this notional uh, figure, and we'll be looking at both the axes. But let's first start with you know, uh, the y-axis, since you know, we kind of started talking about the next 3D, which is uh, on-chip 3D integration. Make sense? Anybody has any quick questions at this point? Probably not, okay, good. 
Now, one thing that I really want to warn you because there is a lot of misconception that are going on in the community about what is you know, this 3D business, right? So there are many kinds of 3D. So most people, when they talk about 3D and you read papers on 3D, they are not actually talking about this next 3D that I'm talking about in this presentation. They are mostly talking about what I call 3D folding. What is 3D folding? So if you look at the left panel over here, right? So you know, there's this compute chip and the memory chip, right? I was showing, showing before, right? And you, you spend enormous amount of energy going back and forth between the compute chip and the memory chip. What those 3D folding people literally do is that they will take this compute chip and then will fold it in, you know, multiple layers, right? And then as a result, what would happen is that, you know, the wire lengths, you know, inside that compute chip, because now it's in 3D layers, will somewhat, you know, get short. And there will be some benefits. You know, like the benefits would be roughly around 40%, you know, for this compute chip. And, but the trouble is that the memory wall still continues to stay. And we were talking about the memory wall being the big wall. So although you have done 3D folding, you have not done much good, basically. So and as a result, you know, like it has very limited, you know, energy delay product benefits, maybe around 40%. Now, 40% is not something to just ignore. But the trouble is, you know, the cost and the effort to put, that you have to put in to enable these kinds of technologies, you know, and we are going to get into some details soon, it's tremendous. So nobody's going to put all this, you know, work just for a 40% benefit. Versus what we are doing in Next3D, and that's why we are getting 100 to 1,000x energy delay product benefit rather than a 40% benefit, is because we are essentially getting rid of the memory wall. We are you know, bringing in both the logic and the memory, and all memory and all compute are on a single chip. So that means that you would never have to go off chip. Okay. That is the idea of the next 3D. So if you, never, if you would never have to go off chip, then what would you do with on chip? With on-chip, now you can have many concurrent on-chip memory accesses to your memory, okay? And there are new architectural design points that are now enabled with this kind of a 3D physical design that you would not get with this kind of 3D folding that I was talking about on the left panel. So that's the key. That's why Next3D is very different from most papers that you read about 3D that I call 3D folding, okay? So, uh, so what are we going to do? So for the next part of the presentation, I will stick to my point. I will just say that, you know, like all memory and all computer on a single chip, right? And how do you realize something like that? And so on and so forth, right? Now, obviously, all of us knows that you cannot have all memory and all computer on a single chip because as soon as you have a lot of memory on a single chip, you know, somebody will have an application that will require even more memory. Right, so this whole notion of this dream chip, that all memory and all compute on a single chip, you know, it's, it's just, a, you know, you, you know th that never happens, it's a moving target. So we will address that question, and that's where this interchip integration continuum will come in. But, you know, we'll come to that later in this presentation. Make sense? Okay, good. So how do we realize this next 3D chip, right? So we are going to have these multiple layers of logic and memory, and there are many ways to do this, okay? And you know, this, is, this presentation is not about materials. This presentation is not about nanotechnologies. So I'm not even going to get into that. You know, you know, I always joke that if you have a room full of nanotechnologists and ask the question that which technology is the best way to implement you know, whatever you're, you're going to implement, let's say the next 3D chip, the only answer that everybody agrees on is my technology, okay? But this is not a nanotechnology forum, so it does not even matter, okay? So, you know, there's a whole bunch of, you know, uh, technologies, these are called back-end of line compatible technologies. I'll explain to you in, you know, in, in a few slides what back-end of line compatible means. But, you know, essentially, you know, you have this carbon nanotube transistors, resistive RAM, magnetic RAM, you know, you just name it. You know, uh, in my group, you know, uh, and in our, my collaborators and I, we look at carbon nanotubes. There are, you know, many reasons for that. I won't get into those details. If you, you know, want to ask me a question, you know, if some of you love 2D materials more than carbon nanotubes, you can realize, you know, a next 3D chip and so on and so forth. Okay. So that's sort of, you know, um, like, you know, technologies to do that. Similarly, you now remember, 
you know, like that's for logic, right? You know, and you know, but remember that when we when we are talking about the next 3D, you know, similarly, you know, you have to worry about memory. And again, for memory, it's the same thing. You know, there's a whole bunch of memory technologies that you could use. And in today's forum, I'm not going to get into which specific memory technology is better than the other. We can discuss that during the panel if you folks want. But one of the memory technologies that we work on at Stanford very significantly uh, is what is called the resistive RAM memory technology or the RRAM. Uh, the resistive RAM memory technology, what does it do? You know, unlike you know, SRAM or DRAM, where the information is stored as charge, in a resistive RAM memory technology, the information is stored as resistance of some material. And you're changing the resistance. You know, sometimes it's a high resistance state, sometimes it's in a low resistance state, and you, you know, perform set and resets to go back and forth between these high and low resistance states. So I will actually talk a lot more about this resistive RAM, but we have done some pretty good stuff out of this. You know, like we demonstrated you know, non-volatile computing systems, you know, multiple bits per cell, you know, you will see a lot of this. Uh, even this notion of, you know, if some of you are familiar with, you know, 1T1 or resistive RAM, we even created this notion of 1TN or resistive RAM, but if you're not familiar with, don't worry about it. You know, uh, those are like nitty gritty details of, you know, resistive RAM technology. You know, in today's presentation, I'll be focusing mostly on systems aspects, you know, and I'll show you some actual demos and so on. So now that you know, we kind of touched upon logic and you know, memory, you know, um, what is really important is this ultra-dense 3D, right? You know, remember you know, that I highlighted. And here is a simulation chart which shows this. So along the x-axis, what it is showing is what is the pitch between 3D connections, what is the distance between 3D connections, right? And, and the y-axis, what it does is that it shows energy delay product benefits for accelerators for a wide range of app workloads. For example, you know, from AI to genomics to SLAM, you, know, you just name it, right? So what is interesting is if you look at these curves, the big benefits are somewhere over here, right? And this is where the connections pitch between the various 3D connections is very sharp. You know, like it's like you know, around 100 nanometers or something like that. Versus, you know, state of the art, what people use are, you know, uh, what are called through silicon vias or TSVs. How many of you have heard of TSVs? Good. You know, so TSVs are what? TSVs are like these, you know, big fat pillars. You know, you know, I, I, I liken TSVs to, you know, the three bridges. How many of you have, you know, traveled to San Francisco? How many of you, you know, try to drive between San Francisco and Berkeley? Or were in a car? Okay, you know, if you ever tried, what would happen is that you're always stuck in traffic. Okay, why? Because there are only three bridges that are connecting San Francisco and Berkeley. And San Francisco and Berkeley are examples of classic Moore's law. These are cities that are, you know, very populated. You know, just like you have the compute chip and the memory chip very populated, lots of transistors. But there are very few pins that are connecting the compute and memory that Professor Mutlu was talking about. Similarly, there are only three bridges that connect San Francisco and Berkeley. So as a result, what happens? You're always stuck in traffic. You know, that's exactly what Professor Mutlu was talking about in his presentation, the memory wall. So, you know, the, what are the TSVs, the through silicon vias? They're the three bridges between San Francisco and Berkeley. You know, for traffic to really flow so that you never have to wait, what do you need? you need millions of bridges between San Francisco and Berkeley, then all the cars would always just go through, right? You know, and that's exactly what I mean by very dense vertical connections, right? Uh, the TSVs today, for example, are even worse than 10 microns, but you know, like, you know, but I, I just took 10 microns, for example, as a starting point. Okay, so is this possible to build? Yes, it is. How do you build it? The, the, Densest vertical connections known to humankind are what? Who can tell me? How do you create a very dense vertical connection? The hint is that it's already there inside your chips today. Those are the vias that are connecting the various metal layers inside your chip, right? Those are already there. So the creating dense vertical connections is not the problem. The problem is that our chips, they have transistors in the bottommost layer and they have metal wires on the upper layers. You don't have any transistors or memory cells on the upper layers. Why? Because it takes a 
around 1000 degrees C to build a silicon transistor. And if you have, want to build a silicon transistor on an upper layer, all the stuff that you built underneath would be severely damaged. This is called the thermal budget of a fabrication process. So what you need is what are called back end of line compatible transistors and memory technologies so that you can build them at a very low temperature of less than 400 degrees C, then you can have any arbitrary memory or logic on any arbitrary layer of, of our integrated circuit chips. So that's the way, that is called monolithic 3D integration and that sort of is one way to achieve very dense you know, you know, 3D connectivity. That's not the only way, but that's one way of getting this ultra dense uh, connectivity. Anyway, so do these things work? You know, so actually for uh, like over the like last 10 years, you know, our group has been building almost, you know, one every year, you know, like of these nano systems and, you know, um, you know, actual hardware, actual demonstrations. And I will actually go through some of these examples. So I won't, you know, drag you through uh, this chart. But what is really exciting is that uh, over the past uh, three, four years, these technologies that I'm talking about, these carbon nanotube transistors, uh, resistive RAM, <laughs> monolithic 3D, these are actually working in actual foundries. So at analog devices, uh, you know, and, and that effort is being led by you know, my former student, uh, Professor Max Schulacher, who is a professor at MIT. And, you know, and you know, you know, through a DARPA program at this silicon foundry, which is called the Skywater Technology Foundry here you know, like in the US. Anyway, so the point is, these are not some you know, fantasy you know, academic you know, discussions about you know, what technologies could be used. These actually work in real life, okay? So let me show you some examples of this you know, nanosystems hardware, okay? I will start with uh, this one. This is a 3D nanosystem. It's you know, kind of old by now. It's a, like a five years old. Uh, this was in 2017. This was the first demonstration where we had silicon transistors, carbon nanotube transistors, you know, a megabit of resistive RAM, and a millions of carbon nanotube transistors as sensors on the top. And what uh, this was doing is, this was sensing data at up to terabytes per second, you know, capturing it and storing it in on-chip memory, and then performing machine learning computation uh, using support vector machine. Uh, you know, uh, this is the dream of this edge AI IoT, right? That you know, everybody talks about, sensing, storage, and compute on a single chip, right? So that was, you know, in 2017, you know, uh, and then in uh, 2018, we demonstrated what is called hyperdimensional computing hardware. So everybody talks about AI, and this is something that, you know, we can discuss during the panel, that, you know, and, and, and obviously the, the mainstream world goes after neural nets. But if you look at brain-inspired computing, that's much broader than just neural nets. And one such computing model is what is called HD or hyperdimensional computing model. And you know, one of the advantages of this hyperdimensional computing model is that it performs what is called one shot or few shot learning. Which means that you don't have to show you know, millions of you know, cat videos to you know, make it recognize a cat. So for example, um, for this chip that we built, this was actually demonstrated live to a live audience at ISSCC. Uh, in 2018, and people were typing in, you know, uh, people were training languages to this chip, you know, right in front of everybody, basically, right? It would just take a few sentences for this chip to understand that, oh, this is French, this is German, this is Spanish, and it, then it could go and, you know, immediately recognize languages, for example. So that's what this chip was able to do. Another funny thing that we did on this chip is that everybody worries about variations and things like that, right? And everybody says, oh, you know, variations are bad. What we found is that our, you know, variations with this, you know, carbon nanotubes and resistive RAM were actually very good. So we didn't have much variations and we actually wanted a lot of variations so that we could create randomness and so on, right? And we had to be very good with respect to variations. Why? Because as I was showing you on the previous slide that now these technologies are in actual foundries and actual fabrication facilities, right? You know, carbon nanotubes and monolithic 3D at ADI, at analog devices, they're building actual, you know, chips. 
And you know, and you know, carbon nanotubes, resistive RAM, monolithic 3D at sky water, where we are actually taping out chips. So to be able to get there, the variations have to be very good, and we were actually getting very good variations. But then, how do you even create more variations intentionally so that you create randomness? So we actually had to play clever tricks for that sort of thing. So that was 2018. In 2019, this was in collaboration with CEA Leti. Actually, we built a non-volatile computing system with you know, uh, silicon CMOS from ST and CEA Leti's resistive RAM on top of that. And this was at ISSC 2019. And we were able to demonstrate quite a few very interesting things. And you know, like, first of all, our question was, what do we actually demonstrate? So we actually went head on with industrial chips with embedded flash, for example, right? Because everybody says, oh, you know, you have a new technology, is the new technology, can it do anything good? And this was, at that time in 2019, actually very few people had actual, actual access to these kinds of you know, resistive RAM macros and things like that, so that you could build an actual system. And what we were able to demonstrate, and this is hardware demonstration apples to apples, compared to the embedded flash chip, our resistive RAM you know, non-volatile computing system was 28x lower energy on average for active energy. 28x lower energy. And it enabled what is called fine-grained temporal power gating because when you're at the edge, you do not want to be turned on all the time. You want to sleep and you want to wake up very quickly, do your computation and go back to sleep. And that sort of a thing is enabled by uh, you know, this resistive RAM. And as a result, we, in actual hardware, we were able to demonstrate 10x battery life versus the flash chip. Now, when you have these technologies such as resistive RAM and even flash 2, you know, they have endurance problems, which means you cannot write too many times into those uh, memories. So then what do you do? Well, we had to innovate, there was a technique uh, that you know, one of my postdocs created called Endurer. With the new Endurer technique, again measured, we were able to show 10 years of continuous AI in inference at the edge. You know, many people ask me a question, why do you need you know, endurance, why do you have endurance issues for AI inference? Guess what? When you are at the edge, you are turning you know, things on and off. That means that you have to do checkpointing and you have to write. And you have to make sure that those writes do not mess up your resistive RAM. Okay? And this was also actually the first system you know, built out of resistive RAM where we were able to demonstrate in actual hardware that this multiple bits per cell actually working in the context of a computing system. And we had 2.3, uh, uh, you know, uh, 2.5 or, you know, I think, bits per cell. And as a result, we were able to demonstrate you know, significantly better inference. So let's get into the multiple bits per cell on this slide. So you know, before us, Many people, what they would do is that they would cherry pick a resistive RAM cell and say, ha ha, on this resistive RAM cell, I could actually program five bits per cell up to 32 levels. But you, as you know very well, that does, does not fly in real life, right? In real life, you actually have a full array, and you have to make sure that in spite of all the variations and everything, that you are able to demonstrate, you know, uh, like whatever number of bits per cell. And, you know, because of new algorithms that we created, to program how to how to program those you know resistive RAM cells and how to read out of the resistive RAM cells and so on and so forth, we are able to demonstrate you know up to four bits per cell. So that means you know 16 levels in every resistive RAM cell in a big array. And as a result, then with our non-volatile computing system, what we did is now for the same uh, you know amount of memory, now you can store bigger neural nets pretty much, right? But you have to be super careful about that because if you were very naive and if you did not do your weight encoding right, then because of the variability of the you know, multiple bits per cell storage of the resistive RAM cells, your, actually, your, uh, your inference quality could go down. So we actually had to co-optimize between how the weight encoding of the neural nets would look like and what are the characteristics of this multiple bits per cell storage and as a result, we were able to show 2.3x better inference accuracy because now we were storing a bigger model for the same hardware, right? So that was in uh, you know, 2019 you know, ISSCC. And uh, last year at VLSI, right around this time, uh, we actually demonstrated this chip called the Chimera. This was the first uh, you know, AJI chip 
that did both inference and training based on this Resistiframe macros um, you know, from a foundry. This was in collaboration with TSMC. So uh, TSMC gave us access. So in this Chimera chip, as I said that you know, right in the beginning I was talking about this, right? So I tell my students that you know, whatever we build, we will never have off-chip memory accesses, right? So that's why there is this big you know, you know, red thing over here, no off-chip memory accesses, okay? So it's with on-chip memory accesses, and you know, TSMC told us that they're only going to give us two megabytes of you know, foundry resistive RAM for the chip, right? We'll come back to these two megabytes, you will you know, hear very soon, but just listen me out. Because you now just have a non-volatile memory on chip, that means you don't have to go back and forth between some SRAM on chip and some non-volatile memory off chip and so on and so forth, you actually create new data flows that you would not otherwise create. And this new, as a result of these new data flows, we were able to have 20x less on chip SRAM because you have the non-volatile memory on chip, you do not have to go off chip. So, uh, so by itself, natively, that thing has a lot of benefit. But the question really is, hey, you know, TSMC gave us only two megabytes of on-chip resistive RAM. If you look at ResNet 18, for example, as a you know, neural net, that would have 12 megabytes of weights, right? You know, if you look at you know, overall storage. So what do you do? You, know, like you just you know, put yourself in two megabytes of you know, tiny little neural nets because you know, I told my students that you cannot access off-chip memory. So that would be the next part of my presentation. So if you take a step back, what did I talk about until now? So I introduced this notion of next 3D mosaic, and you know, I was mostly talking about the y-axis. So now let's focus on the x-axis, which is the idea that doesn't really matter how much 3D you do, you, you, know, like, you can never fulfill you know, people's needs for more memory and more compute. So we have to do something else about that, right? So that's the x-axis. Any quick question at this point? Okay, good, yeah. Okay, good, okay. So to kind of, to talk about this x-axis, let me introduce this notion that I at least like a lot of this notion of a dream chip, okay? So what is a dream chip? A dream chip is a chip where, as I was saying early on, all memory and all compute is on that chip, quickly accessible at a very low energy. Everybody would agree that you know, if somebody could give you a dream chip, you know, life would be great, yes, right? Okay. So, but the dream chip is infeasible. Why is it infeasible? I already talked about the miniaturization wall and that's why we are going 3D. You know, I talked about the beggars cannot be choosers, right? You know, TSMC told us that you are going to get only two megabytes of resistive RAM, we are not going to give you more than that. That's an example of beggars cannot be choosers, right? You know, and, and the third thing is very important is the moving target. You know, you give somebody a certain amount of memory on a chip with certain amount of compute, guess what, they will come up with the next neural net that will require more memory than whatever you gave them, right? So that's why this dream chip is infeasible. Although it's a good notion, right? So remember on this dream chip, what I did is that I said the amount of on-chip memory is n times m. There is a reason for this, okay? I just, I'm just drawing your attention to this, okay? So now that you know, we cannot build a dream chip, what do we do in today? today in today's world, what we do is that you know, we, we put in maybe m amount of memory on-chip, right? And then n minus one times m amount of memory off-chip. And you have the memory wall that you know, Professor Mutlu was talking about and I you know, uh, talked about earlier and so on and so forth, right? And as a result, there are large energy delay product overheads of doing this thing because you spend all your time and energy. We are talking about San Francisco and Berkeley, the three bridges and so on, right? Everybody's with me? Up to this point, it's extremely important that you are with me, okay? Okay, now I'm going to introduce this idea of what I call illusion to get around this problem. And what is this illusion idea? At a very high level, it's nothing but you know, a multi-chip system solution, okay? But, but I will actually draw your attention to why is it very different from most multi-chip systems that people talk about. So what we did is that in this illusion system, you can see there are n chips, and each chip has m amount of memory, so overall the system still has this n times m, which I wanted to target in my dream chip, right? But very importantly, uh, each chip has, can store and each chip can compute. 
Unlike previously where some chips can store and some chips can compute, right? Number one. Number two, this N, this M, is a very important parameter. So, you know, like you can look at this, you know, diagram that I have and say, you know, like what is this guy talking about? This has been known since the 1960s, you know, ILIAC-4, you know, that was a, you know, like a multi-chip system. And ILIAC-4 is, I think, all of us in this room probably were not born, you know, when ILIAC-4 happened, right? So, you know, how is it any different from that, you know, every chip can compute and every chip can store. And this is where this notion of illusion deviates from traditional multi-chip systems. Why? Because it's extremely important that every chip has enough on-chip memory. So, you know, you're not going to have n times m on-chip memory on, you know, every chip, but you want to make sure that, you know, there is enough on-chip memory. This notion of enough is extremely important, and I will get into some more details later on. Why? Because if you had one bit per chip, it's useless, right? Because then, you know, you have to go to, you know, like you will need, you know, maybe a zillion chips and, you know, all bits are off. So you have to have enough memory per chip. Number two, when you have a multi-chip system, you know, ideally you would like to keep all your chips very busy. But if you try to keep all your chips very busy, your traffic between the various chips could also be very busy too. So it may not be possible for you to keep all the chips very busy all the time. And if you cannot keep all the chips very busy all the time, it's extremely important that the chips that are not busy, you very quickly turn them on and off. So this notion of you know, fine-grained temporal power getting that I was talking about in the context of resistive ramp, for example, that becomes extremely important. And then number three comes, given the fact that you have enough, on -chip, enough memory per chip and you can turn chips on and off very quickly, that enables you special mapping that typically you would not use for traditional parallelization. And I will give you some examples of that. So what did we do? We actually took you know, this, you know, this notion of multi-chip system and we turned it on its head. Because traditionally what people would do, they're given certain chips, you know, and then they would say, well, you know, given these chips, what can I do, you know, like, you know, how can I build a parallel system? Instead, what we are doing is the opposite. We are saying that, tell me how much memory do I need per chip? And, you know, what characteristics of quick turning on and off business I need so that I can enable you know, special mappings. And what is the specialty of the special mappings? That the interchip network would be very sparsely used, right? If I can make all these things happen, if I can get all these stars aligned, then what can I achieve? I achieve the illusion of the dream chip. What is the illusion of a dream chip? The illusion of the dream chip is that my overall energy of my whole system, including all the traffic that's going between these you know, multiple chips, my overall energy will be within the 5% of the dream chip, and my overall execution time will be within 5% of the dream chip. That means that my energy delay product of this illusion system would be within 10% of the dream chip, and since that's a very large number, 100 to 1000 X, this illusion system is going to do darn good. Now, is that possible? The answer is it was, it's possible. So, you know, uh, using the Chimera chips that I was talking about, right? So, two megabytes per uh, chip, right? We're using the, you know, TSMC tape outs. We were able to do ResNet 18, which is a 12 megabytes so using six chips. And you see that we achieve within 5% of the dream energy and within 5% of the dream execution time. And this was measured for AI inference, but you can do it for a whole lot of stuff, okay? Uh, so let me show you, you know, uh, you know, like a few examples of how these, you know, special mappings look like. And you can see that, you know, so, you know, here, this is with the Chimera six chips, you know, 12 megabytes ResNet 18, you know, so here are six chips and this is a scheduling diagram. You see that you get all sorts of funny schedules that you can actually build. These are actually very special mappings that typically do not happen with you know, traditional parallelization. And all of these mappings are within 10% you know, of the dream energy delay product that I was talking about before. So, and as a result of that, we were able to show, so you know, there was a well-known paper that came out of NVIDIA. Uh, this is called, uh, you know, uh, you know, this was at VLSI and then you know, at Micro. And you know, that would use traditional parallel processing. So this, they were also using chiplets. 
but they were using more traditional parallelization, so they were inundated with traffic. For example, for a 12 megabyte, you know, uh, uh, ResNet 18, for example, if you use their mappings, it would take 10 megabytes of messages. So if you had two megabyte per chip, and if you had 10 megabytes of messages, that's like equivalent to having, you know, just off chip, you know, 10 megabytes of off chip memory, for example. So versus over here, as a result, you see an order of magnitude improvement using these illusion mappings, even for the same amount of memory per chip, okay? Uh, you know, versus traditional parallel, for example. And, you know, an illusion is ideal for AI because a whole bunch of, you know, workloads, you know, you talk about CNNs, LSTMs, you talk about inference training, you can actually do this illusion and you can, you know, achieve this, you know, 10% uh, EDP with respect to the dream chip. Now, one question that people ask me all the time in the context of illusion is that can illusion keep up? Because if you look at the workload size, right? So if you have, you know, ResNet 18, you know, today it's ResNet 18 is 12 megabytes, you know, then 48 megabytes and so on and so forth, you know, like, you know, you could have, you know, 12 gigabytes of, you know, ResNet 18 in 10 generations, right? And can you keep up illusion? And that is a very important question because you have to think about that not in terms of Moore's law. You have to think about in terms of the period when miniaturization ends. So let's say that the miniaturization has ended, right, today. And you, know, and you want to scale you know, this, you know, this you know, 12 megabytes to 12 gigabytes for the next 10 generations. What would you do? How can illusion help in that context? Does this make sense, the, the, the problem statement? So here is a really interesting idea. And you know, so we had an invited paper at IEDM last December, and this is where we talked about very superficially and we are working on more details. Here is the idea. So now, you know, miniaturization has ended, okay? So let's think of a world, and it's not that very far, in maybe 10 to 10 years, maybe 15 years, maybe I do not know, okay? In your lifetime, okay? Miniaturization has ended, so what can I do at that point? There are not many things I can do, if you really think about. So, you know, of course you, you'll be doing 3D, you know, that's given, okay? But even if you do 3D, you are only going to increase the number of 3D layers linearly per generation. You're not going to, it's not going to be exponential like, you know, what, you know, like we were used to in the past, right? So I said, okay, very modest that you will have a linear increase in the number of 3D layers. But my workload is increasing exponentially on the previous slide, right? You know, by 2x every generation. So how can I keep up? So similarly, I think it's reasonable to think that the interchip connections that I have in my illusion system, those, that quality, you know, the bandwidth, the energy, you know, uh, and so on, that would improve linearly. That's a, like a modest, you know, uh, projection to make. So when you linearly increase the number of 3D layers on a chip, the number of messages that are going back and forth between this illusion, in the illusion system, that also reduces kind of linearly, okay? Given the illu special illusion mappings. This is where the illusion mappings become extremely important. And, you know, of course, linearly increasing, improving the chip-to-chip -chip links, that reduces the power message cost. And this is where the magic happens. The way this illusion is set up, the benefits multiply. So you get a quadratic improvement in the total message cost of an illusion system, even though, you know, things are improving linearly. Did that make sense? And as a result, and here is the key idea, so if you have a quadratic improvement, then within a limited period of time, you can always match a quadratic with an exponential, right? And that is the key idea. So as a result, what you can do now is that if you take, for example, you know, again, remember the y-axis is on-chip 3D integration, the x-axis is the interchip links, right? So what you do is that you create this notion of what I call illusion scale-up. So you maintain that within 10% of the dream EDP, while the dream chip is becoming bigger and bigger and bigger, you are keeping up and illusion is keeping up for larger and larger workloads. So this is the key for scale up that I believe that's going to happen. So you know, as you can see, that you have 1x, 4x, 16x, up to you know, 1024x. So kind of you get an equivalent of a 10 generations of exponentially increasing workload size 
even though you are not you know, miniaturizing by using these combinations. The other thing is you know, equally important, and this is something that you know, is not talked about in industry today, which is the fact that you know, there is this notion of illusion being fungible. Which means that you know, today, the industry is mostly talking about the interchip integration. This is called the chiplets, right? Everybody's talking about chiplets. But if you just keep doing chiplets, unless you have some magical interchip links, you know, that will you know, communicate by telepathy so that they have zero energy you know, and you know, zero delay, you know, you're not going to be able to keep up. And that's why this notion of the combination of on-chip 3D and illusion with the right kind of interchip links is the key. Okay. So that's my second part, and the very last part, I will take five minutes and then I'll be out of here. I think, you know, so I, 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 I'll take five more minutes. So this creates many nanosystems opportunities. You know, uh, you know Professor Mutlu talked about this notion of co-design between device circuits, architecture, and algorithms. I'll give you one example of that, okay? Uh, one thing that I did not touch upon in this presentation is thermal, because as soon as you think of 3D, you think of thermal. Uh, for the next 3D uh, idea that I was talking about earlier, in the first generation, the logic on the upper layers are used for memory accesses. And memory accesses are cold, so that's why you do not need special thermal solutions. But when the miniaturization wall hits, you have to go and put compute on the upper layers, and that's where new thermal solutions are going to be key. I won't have the time to talk about that. And similarly, I won't have the time to talk about software optimizations. But let me show you, you know, some examples of core design. What is core design? The idea is that multiple abstraction layers, and multiple is very important, cooperate for very large benefits. And I will take our Chimera example that I was talking about earlier, right? You know, where we showed the illusion and so on. Uh, uh, and I will specifically take this notion of edge AI training because it's an edge AI workshop. Uh, I'll, I'll be wrapping up in five minutes. I'm almost done. So, uh, so what is you know? So when we started de designing this Chimera chip, I told the students. I said, you know, we have to show edge AI training because nobody has shown edge AI training. You know, especially on these non-volatile systems. Now, and everybody said, are you crazy? You know, you could never do AGI training on such non-volatile systems because uh, these memory technologies, for example, resistive RAM and others, their write characteristics are terrible. You know, it takes an enormously long time to write. The energy, write energy is extremely bad. And write endurance, you know, like, you know, you will be gone in a month. So how the heck are you going to do, you know, training at the edge? And even if you think of incremental training, which means that you know, like you 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 first you know uh, like download some weights you know you know based on cloud-based training and at the edge you know this you know chip is looking at you know you know you 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 trained on image ImageNet and now this chip is looking at flowers and it's going to tune its weights and so on and so forth. Even if you try to do incremental training, it would not work. Why? Because stochastic gradient descent, which is you know conventional way of doing training, has too many rights. And if you have too many writes into the memory, God bless you, right? And so the idea that we thought of, we said, well, but nobody has said that training itself needs a lot of writes. It's just because, you know, as Professor Mutlu was saying, whoever took a, you know, a computer algorithms class, right? You know, the algorithms people came up with a, like a training algorithm. They were not told that they have to avoid writes, right? They, you know, like, they didn't know anything about it, right? You know, they came up with, that thing, and now we are, what we are doing, we are taking their algorithm and we are baking into hardware. But now we have to flip the problem. We have to say that, okay, now our memories have a lot of write issues. Can I come up with training algorithms that would have very good accuracy and at the same time it would have drastically fewer writes? You, you know, nobody has said that that's impossible. You know, and if that would be possible, that you know, like, would make things work. And guess what? We were able to do that. So one of the students, you know, he came up uh, with this, what is called LRT or low rank training. Essentially he was doing a little more computation uh, for uh, fewer writes. And you know, I, I won't get into the details, you can read the paper, this is Albert who did it. And this is what he got. He was able to show 100x fewer weight update steps <coughs> 
you know, com compared to stochastic gradient descent. 100x. And this is measured as a result, he was able to get 340x better energy delay product measured on actual hardware doing AJI incremental training, you know, using his LRT for ISO accuracy compared to stochastic gradient descent. Right? And oh, by the way, now we were able to show that you could have 10 years of AGI training at the edge at 20 samples per minute. Versus if you wanted to use stochastic gradient descent, this chip would die in two weeks. So this is an example of, I believe, co-design where you're actually creating new algorithms you know, to overcome the underlying challenges. So that's what I had to say. So to conclude this presentation, I talked about the fact that you can build nanosystems today and you know, as I said that you know, some of the nanotechnologies, for example, the carbon nanotube transistors, the resistive RAM, the monolithic 3D, they actually work in actual industrial facilities at analog devices, at Skywater. These are, Skywater is a silicon foundry, a commercial silicon foundry. And ADI, you know, all of us knows ADI, you know, it's a fortune you know, company, number one. Number two, this notion of this combination of next 3D mosaic and illusion scale up. I believe that's the key you know, for the future to achieve computation immersed in memory and to get large benefits with growing problem sizes because we have to address both. And number three, co-design of the right kind you know, you know, is a big opportunity for nanosystems. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, before we go into the question part, I have a small announcement. We have a little change uh, on our schedule. So I we suggest to s finish the lunch at one o'clock to let uh, Professor Terrier to join our uh, panel session. So uh, at this point, I suggest that we have one urgent question for the audience and all your questions please keep for the panel so yeah, we have 45 panel, minutes yeah. of interactive questions and I think it will be a great uh, opportunity to discuss uh, all, sure. all, all the questions. Is it fine? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I think you are pointing out uh, that the, the core problem, the illusion scale up, right? Um, and, uh, you know, I'm not a specialist in this, I'm rather in device technology. However, there is one aspect that you may want a bit to elaborate. We, we know when you move to multi-core architecture, you see that from a certain number of cores, you see a saturation you know, in, in performance, energy efficiency, because also the algorithms become very complex, mm -hmm. right? And, and you pointed out advantages, but you have not discussed kind of projection if there is any saturation in efficiency and performance due to maybe complexity of the algorithm you have to manage yeah. so, or so other aspects that will um, right will, uh, so, so, so so even before that remember that I was using two linears and I was multiplying them and I was trying to fake an exponential right and that's why what I said was very important that within a limited time period you're going to fake that as if it's exponential. As soon as you go past that point, then obviously my quadratic is going to, you know, like, you know, you know, like fall far away from how the exponential is going to go. And that sort of is the thing. So that tipping point is very important. But the, the key point I'm trying to make is like, so first of all, a concrete example that, hey, even with these two things that I was talking about, you are getting a 10 generations equi equivalent of benefits, basically. Yeah, you know, like maybe it doesn't go up to 20 generations, but 10 generations is a pretty large number, basically, number one. But number two is this notion of multiplicative benefits. That I, I think that what would happen is that with the miniaturization wall, you know, I do not think that there will be this one knob, which is that, you know, oh, you know, make the transistor smaller and everything will be great. That being gone, this multiple benefits, even the individual benefits are linear. If we can actually create them in such a way that they actually multiply, so that at a system level I get a multiplicative benefit, then actually 
I think we have lots of opportunities. So I just, I just showed you quadratic because I had two linear benefits. There might be something else you know, that, that could actually give another linear benefit that I'm not thinking. So if we can actually you know, keep creating these linear benefits, but what we have to be careful is that these linear benefits really multiply because many, many benefits do not multiply. And that is the problem, and I wanted to draw attention to that. But you're right, you know, anything, unless it is truly exponential beyond a certain point, you know, exponential is going to go like this, and you know, like the gap is going to keep increasing. But still, I think there is a lot of opportunity there. Thanks. <laughs>